Hello and welcome back. Today I have a really cool project to share with you guys. I'm here with one of the legacy volunteers here at National Auburn Cavalry Collection here in Fort Benning, Georgia. And he's going to tell you all about this unique M47 patent tank and its restoration project going on here at the shop. Good morning, I'm Bill Ferguson. I'm one of the volunteers here at the National Armor and Cavalry Museum collection. And apparently today we're gonna to talk about the M47. Uh, the M47 is the, of course, the child of the M46 and the parent to the M48. Uh, what makes our M47 slightly different is you'll notice a multitude of holes cut in the armor. Uh, this was done years and years back as a training aid for students coming through Fort Knox uh, this particular tank sat in the museum at Fort Knox for quite a number of years before we moved down here in 2010. Uh, but since then, it has sat outside for the past 10 years and has, has got a little bit of outside eye that's going on. So our M47 cutaway, we'll start here at the front. As you can see, the front armor is cut away, showing the driver and bow gunner position. Uh, that way students could look in, see everything, all the controls, all the indicators, all the mechanical bits and parts uh, to get a better idea of how the tank worked. So, and as you walk around, you'll notice one thing that's been added, one thing that's missing. The thing that's missing is, of course, all the fenders and spots and boxes and everything else. But what's been added is a nice little sturdy catwalk for students to climb up and walk along and peer inside the tank. So as we move along, of course, we have a glaring deficiency in armor here. Uh, this whole section has been cut away to show both the thickness of the armor and the inner workings of the tank. Uh, it's a little dirty and rough right now uh, from suffering from outside itis. So as we move to the back, something else that's glaringly missing is the entire rear deck assembly. So this was pulled and replaced with like quarter inch plexiglass so you can see the inner workings of the engine, the transmission, and all the linkage that go with it. Uh, and you'll be able to see that a little better once we get up top and I clean some dirt off. So, one of the things I didn't plan on when I started this project, uh, well, let's go with two things. A, it's, it was in much worse shape than what I thought. Uh, it's been stored under cover, it's been tarped, you know, it's been basically taken care of as best you can with, with vehicles that are outside. But the amount of rust that has accumulated due to the environment down here, of course, and also just the amount of paint that has been used inside this thing. There are some parts I've been stripping in here that have five coats of paint on uh, And the fun part about that is at some point, somebody has used latex. And anybody that's ever had to strip latex with a wire wheel or a putty knife knows it's, it's really, really slow going. So a lot of the parts in here uh, for example, the, the TC's control, which is sitting over on the bench now, uh, which should have been an easy two-day turnaround, ended up taking me a week to ensure that it was done right. Uh, the same thing with the gunner seat and the uh, manual hydraulic pump for the gunner, uh, which, which should have been a real simple, simple turnaround. Uh, it's really ended up taking some time, uh, but now they look new, so that's what matters. So now we're inside the turret. Uh, the first thing you notice is when you get in here, it seems to be awful spacious. Uh, the reason that is, is about half this turret I've removed over the past two or three weeks in, in the process of refurbing it. Of course, the first thing you notice is the 90 millimeter gun. Uh, what makes this gun interesting is a big stamp on here and you really can't, it's hard to see with your camera. It says, do not fire, uh, because it's not truthfully a real gun. The, uh, the actual gun itself is fake and the, uh, the more evacuator system is fake. Uh, moving over into the gunner's position, uh, you can notice I've taken out most of the controls and most of the sights. Uh, the rangefinder is still here. The gunner's primary sight is still here. The commander's primary sight is still here. Uh, but all the controls have been removed. I'm actually working on those right now. Uh, moving to the back, where most tanks keep a bunch of ammo in their, in their turret muscle, you notice this is all taken up by radios and storage because radios at that time were rather large and cumbersome. We actually have a radio for this one. And it'll take up that entire area. Uh, everything else up here is taken up by both your grease gun racks for your machine guns 
and extra ammo boxes, which encompass here, and also back in that front corner is all ammo for the uh, coaxial machine gun. Now what makes this particular M47 a little different than most is most M47s come with a 50 caliber coaxial machine gun, uh, which everybody thinks is all hoo hoo. This one did not have that. It was purpose built with a 30 out 6 machine gun. So the ammo racks for it are a lot smaller, uh, the mount's a little smaller, and the feed system's smaller. Uh, but once everything's back in here, when you have a three, three men in here, the loader basically has this area, and that's all he gets. The commander has this area, and that's all he gets. And the gunner, once his seat and electronics and controls are in, are in is in a pretty uh, tight squeeze uh, because there's a guard that comes off the breach here, and comes out to here. So once he's in there and the TC's knees are in his head, he's pretty much out of room. Uh, all along this left side here is where your ready rounds for your 90 would be in racks. And you can see right down here where the, the base of the round would sit. So as far as ammunition at the ready, you've only got a few rounds. The rest of your rounds, if you look down there, are in boxes that encompass all the way across the hole down each side. So as I was saying before, this is going to be a working display. Uh, it's going to be fully outfitted. Uh, one of the things you have to do to do that, and one of the things guys had to do in the field, was store your ammunition. Now when you look down along here on the side, and of course down over there on the side you'll see all these ammo racks where these rounds would stack up on top of each other. That way the loader could grab them and put them in its ready rounds. Well, the problem is the loader's right here. The bulk of his rounds are underneath this floor. So, with both of these folded up, he had to find a place to stand to get his rounds out. So basically what you ended up doing was a Chinese fire drill with the ammunition where he would basically have to take out a round, hand it to the tank commander, close the floor, strap it down, open the floor back up, Grab a round, hand it to the tank commander, close the floor, just over and over and over again uh, to ensure that he had all of his ready rounds situated along here. And like I was saying before, you really don't see the, the bulk of these rounds with these racks that come off the side of the turret to hold them up. Uh, it made for some, some pretty tight living conditions. We've been working on this thing for about a month now. We've probably got about another four months left, uh, which coincides with our movement to the TSF, which really works out well because this will be one of the pieces that goes in the TSF. So this will also be one of those pieces we're gonna fully dress out. So all these empty ammunition areas you see and empty storage areas and empty radio positions and empty uh, crew equipment positions, everywhere where a tool bag hangs or a, or a light sits will all be filled in. So when you come up and you look in this thing, you'll be looking at it as if it were ready to go rolling into battle. Uh, the M47 is kind of an interesting beast and I just wanted to add this in, uh, in that it's kind of a, a forgotten tank. Uh, this is one of the few tanks the U.S. has never used in any type of war. Uh, it was used, I think Greece used it in uh, one of their battles, uh, and, I, and I think possibly Turkey. Uh, and they didn't fare well. Uh, the idea behind the M47 was to increase the armor protection of the M26 by narrowing the turret down some and making it less of a target, uh, but basically keeping the same amount of armor. Uh, and, and as they learned, it really, while it's great in theory, it didn't work in practice. No. Most of the 47s you see in collections. Uh, and a great example is up in the Sixth Cover Museum that's up uh, right above Atlanta. A uh, guy by the name of George is, is actually restoring one up there. He comes down here all the time and we swap stories and, part, you know, and ideas and how to make parts and such. Because uh, his is very, very stripped out. His is a Spanish M47. All the data plates, all the instructions, everything is all written in Spanish. 
And what you'll find is most M47s out there that are in museums or on pads in front of VFWs and such are from Spain. So basically we sold, sold Spain a whole bunch of M47s many years ago back in the 50s. And then when they were done with them, they basically gave them back. Uh, the Army didn't really want or need them anymore, so they were all parceled out to museums. Uh, which also, on the outside, a big change between the American and the Spanish versions are the what we call the grunt rails, your storage rails for hanging your knapsacks and whatever else you're carrying. When you look at the Spanish ones, they're usually just single bars that stick out and go across, and there'll be a multitude of them, like four or five. Whereas on a lot of the American ones, it was a, it was a heavier bar and actually had a shelf here. But when you hooked your stuff up, it wouldn't fall off the tank. These are such vanilla tanks. Um, really, I mean, one of the funny things you'll see is the M47 was taken out of service and replaced with the M48. Uh, and the M48 straight, not the M48A1, but the old M48 gasser. Uh, the sponsor box back here that hangs off the back of the turret. A lot of crews would steal that box when they turned this tank in, and they would end up putting it on their 48 because the 48 didn't have any sort of exterior turret storage. So when you go through a lot of historical pictures and archives and such, you'll see M48s in the field with this funny box sitting on the back of the turret that really looks like it's not supposed to be there. It's because it's not supposed to be there because the crew, when they turned in their M47, they stole that box to put on the 48. Okay, uh, just a few things I wanted to point out uh, on the outside that I didn't cover before. Um, most tanks nowadays, or in the, actually in the past 30 years, really had no type of exhaust or muffler. So the sound you get is the sound you get. Uh, but as you'll see on here, where the exhaust comes out of the engine, a big old muffler sits right here. Uh, probably weighs about 65 pounds. It's actually a two-man lift trying to get it off. Uh, it's a lot of fun. So it has a muffler on both sides, uh, which carries over from the M46. Uh, the earlier Pershing, of course, had the exhaust that came straight out the back. Uh, so this is one of the rare oddities where they actually used a muffler uh, to cut down on the sound. Uh, something else I wanted to point out about this particular 47 and that's this little wheel here. Uh, most people look at that little wheel and say, what is that? So basically that's your idler wheel. Uh, these were added when the program first came about. Later variants and later tanks did not have this little piece of hardware. Uh, basically it was there to help keep the track tension on the rear, uh, the way your, your track didn't get sloppy and fall off. Uh, so it's an interesting little bit that uh, most people just don't know about. When you're dealing with tons and tons of steel, in the summer it's really, really hot, and in the winter it's really, really cold. And what the great part about steel is, once it soaks the heat or the cold up, it hangs around for a while. Uh, so anybody that's ever been a tanker, as I was, uh, when you're in the desert in the middle of the summer, you actually have to wear gloves because you will, any part that's, that's painted darker will burn you. And in the winter, uh, once the cold sets into the steel, it is basically like standing in the deep freeze at your local Wendy's. Uh, but to combat that, there's two things you can do. In the summer, you open your hatches, let some fresh air in. Uh, change how your engine draws air. Uh, early naturally aspirated engines, you can either draw air from the outside, or you can actually draw air through the turret. So which would give you a little bit of a breeze. But in the winter, finally, somebody got smart and came up with the hands down most important piece of equipment on this tank, which is a personal heater. Your personal heater, uh, while it worked good, tended to burn you out of the turret after a while. But the trick to the heater, as a lot of veteran tankers can tell you, once you start it, you don't shut it off because you never know if it's gonna start again. Uh, usually your heater will feed from a specific uh, fuel blivet within the vehicle. Uh, on, on most tanks, it's off the left side. So you always want to make sure you kept that left tank nice and full. 
Uh, that way your heater would run basically 2407 the entire time you were in the field. This is the tank commander's override, or if you want to call it the tank commander's power control handle. This is the piece that the commander uses to control the turret. Uh, he, can tr he can control both an azimuth and elevation. Uh, this piece actually sits where he sits. It sits right there by his right hand. So he just kind of rests his arm on there and moves the turret as, as he sees fit. So this was one of those pieces I was talking about before where in reality it looked like it wasn't in too bad shape, but once I got to digging in, uh, that's about a week and a half worth of work right there. What was up with it? Uh, so you have the handle. Of course, you have the palm switch, which engages the hydraulics, and you have the, the trigger. So these both move now, and you can actually hear them click with the little micro switch inside. Uh, that was one big chunk of rust. Uh, would not move, it was froze up. Uh, but now I've got some actually some pretty good movement to it. So the next piece is sits next to the gunner seat, which that's the gunner seat there. This is, this allows the gunner to manually pump the hydraulic system. Uh, so, very simple, it's a pump, ties into the system, it's got a recuperator here to keep a constant pressure. Uh, but what I thought was kind of neat about this little piece, this one here had about seven coats of paint on it. Uh, the paint was so thick, there were actually washers sitting down in here, somebody had dropped, and then had painted over them two or three times. So. This piece took me about a week of constant stripping and sanding. Uh, and you'll notice that the actual pump itself is blue. Uh, the reason I left that blue is because that pump had one coat of paint on it, which leads me to believe that when it was installed, it was blue. So that's the way I took it back. Uh, to get back to that blue color uh, was about a whole day for me with a dental pick, actually picking the paint off because uh, I didn't want to sandblast it, I didn't want to sand it, I didn't want to wire wheel it, because I wanted to keep that anodized finish on that piece. So, kind of a neat piece. Uh, sits right here next to the gunner's right hip, and it's a pump. And if he needs to get a little bit of leverage, it's spring-loaded, so he can grab it and he can pump away. And when he's done, I actually fix the spring in it, it pops back into position. So. Of course, nothing exciting here. It's a gunner seat. Uh, it's actually missing the back right now. It's over in the paint shop drying. Uh, it was one big, basically, chunk of rust. Uh, it took me actually longer to take it apart than it did to actually refurbish it. Uh, so, but now, of course, put the back, it locks in. And of course, if you're a little short gunner, you bring it all the way up. And if you're a real tall guy like me, take it all the way down. So, uh, I've got about seven or eight more parts like this that are actually over in the paint shop drying right now. Uh, I like to paint and let the parts sit for about two or three days. Uh, cuts down on fingerprints in the paint. It also gives that paint time to cure up. Uh, that way it's, it's a nice hard finish instead of a soft finish you have if you handle it too soon. Data plates are are inked. Uh, so when they put that finish on the data plate, it's just a thin film of ink, and then they add in the rest of the data. So a lot of times, if you try to clean those, it erases the data plate. So I got real lucky so far with every data plate I've done, and they've turned out just like that, uh, using a combination of a paint thinner and a toothbrush, and then just scrub them for about two or three hours. So you can see like on this azimuth indicator, that's what you start with, and by the time we're done, of course, it'll look just like that part there. Earlier, I called this my labor of love. Uh, I made a lot. I might have lied a little on that. Uh, whereas I'm giving this tank as much care and attention as I would any other, uh, the 47 is actually my least favorite tank. Uh, it's a conglomeration of, of different styles. Uh, we didn't keep it around long. It was never used in combat as far as U.S. forces go. We t if you notice, we tended to just sell these off to other countries. Uh, Germany, for example, had a whole bunch of them. Uh, in fact, they were used as, as Panther tanks during the Battle of the Bulge movie. 
Uh, and of course, I said before, Spain had a, had a bunch, uh, Turkey had a bunch. So they just weren't a great tank overall, uh, whereas they were a little more technologically advanced than the, the earlier M46s and the 26s before it. They really didn't bring much to the plate as far as a great increase in lethality because it's the same gun uh, shooting usually the same ammunition, sometimes slightly better as, as ammunition progressed. Uh, but you had the same old large hull, uh, the same old gasser engine, uh, which most people know is just gasser engines are a horrible choice for tank just due to lack of power. Uh, the same transmission problems, the same cramped turret, uh, basically all the same problems in my eyes that we ran into early on and we just put them all in one big conglomeration and called it the 47 Thank you guys for watching. I hope you enjoyed this. I would really like to thank Bill for his time and knowledge for this video today. Since the initial filming of this video, a lot of progress has been made and our early production M47 with its cutaways is nearly ready for display. The second phase of the moving project at the NACC is beginning very soon, and I suggest you all support by following along. There's some social media links down in the description below where you can see some of the progress for yourself. Open houses for the new facility to come be able to see this vehicle and others will be scheduled after the move is complete, and you can look forward to updates on those on the social media websites run by the NACC themselves. It's always my pleasure to be able to present some of the goings-on down at the National Armor and Cavalry Collection. I really, really respect and appreciate the core of volunteers there. I really believe that the heart of a museum really does lie with its volunteers, and the staff out there run a great program for them to help keep this vehicle and so, so, so many others. I'm looking forward to being able to share some more of that with you guys. If you liked this vehicle and you want to see some more, go ahead and subscribe to my channel if you haven't already, and I will see you next time.